Hello, I'm Nick Hart. I'm a professor of respiratory and critical care medicine based at St Thomas's Hospital in London. It gives me great pleasure um, to chair this session with Professor Stefano, Nav Stefano Nava. Um, and this session is on the benefits of nasal high flow therapy in COPD patients in their home. This is an exceptionally important topic. And Dr. Nagata, Dr. Kreiner, and Dr. Weinreich are gonna discuss really important areas that we all need to know more about. And it's my privilege to introduce uh, uh, the first speaker. Please, Dr. Nakata, go ahead. I'm Nagata from COVID City Medical Center General Hospital. I'm very happy to talk to you today. I would like to talk mainly about the trial of home high flow nasal cannula oxygen therapy conducted in Japan. This study was supported by funding from TG Pharma Limited. Now, I'm sure I don't need to stress this too much, but uh, severe COPD patients frequently develop chronic respiratory failure, resulting in impaired quality of life. In several large randomized controlled trials, Long-term oxygen therapy has been shown to improve health outcomes and mortality in COPD patients. But especially for severe COPD with hypercapnia, oxygen therapy alone is not sufficient and other treatment options will be needed. One treatment option for those patients is non-invasive ventilation. This is the data from Germany showing the superiority of non-invasive ventilation compared to standard care on mortality for stable hypercapnic COPD patients. But there are many patients who cannot continue non-invasive ventilation because of discomfort and sleep disturbances. High flow nasal cannula oxygen therapy, HFNC, as recently emerging therapy for respiratory care, mainly in the acute care setting. This therapy has several physiological effects, such as positive airway pressure, washout effect in dead space, and supply warm and humidified gas, leading to lesser workload when bleeding. Although there has been much more evidence as a treatment for acute care respiratory failure, the clinical benefit of domiciliary use remains unclear. This slide is a summary of the expected mechanisms by which HFNC leads to long-term improvement for COPD. HFNC is believed to have two major advantages over conventional oxygen derivative derivi systems, the reducing workload of breathing and infection. These effects have been shown to be due to the various physiological mechanisms listed in this slide. In our pilot trial published in 2018, we investigated the efficacy and safety of six-week domiciliary HFNC for stable hypercapnic COPD patients with PSCO2 ranging from 45 to 60 millimeters of mercury, already treated with LTOT. HFNC improves the mean SGLs QC total score significantly by over seven points compared to LTOT alone. Additionally, there are significant improvements in PSCO2 by around 4 millimeters of mercury, pH, and nocturnal PTCCO2 around 5 millimeters of mercury with PHHFNC. In terms of adverse events, a total of four patients experienced severe adverse events. However, these were considered unrelated to the study therapy per the investigators. The most common adverse event related to HFNC was nighttime sweating. Also, a total of seven events occurred during HFNC. They were all considered mild and no one discontinued their treatment. Based on this pilot trial, we conducted the pivotal trial. The main concept of this study was randomized control trial assessing the effect of HFNC for longer period 
only for most severe COPD patients with chronic hyperkapnia and hypoxia. Enrollment period was from 2017 to 2019, and number of participating sites was 42. The inclusion criteria were as follows. 20 years or old, older, COPD with goal state two or above, receiving L dot for at least 16 hours per day for at least one month, and with hypercapnic respiratory failure with PSO2 higher than or equal to 45 millimeters of mercury, and having moderate severe COPD exacerbation within the past one year. The exclusion criteria were the following, having severe and unstable comorbidities or malignancy, history of obstructive sleep apnea syndrome, having exacerbation of COPD or NIV use within the previous four weeks, and the patients with cognitive impairment or psychiatric disorder were excluded. Primary endpoint of this study was counts for 52 weeks of moderate severe COPD exacerbation. Secondary endpoints were as follows. Time to first moderate severe COPD exacerbation, time to death by all causes, health-related quality of life, arterial blood gas measurements, pulmonary function tests, and adverse events. Participants completed the daily diary to recall any increases in upper and lower respiratory tract symptoms, fever, or use of systemic cortical stress, steroids, or antibiotics. Definition of COPD exacerbation and severity in the study was shown in this slide. On this slide, you can see the flow chart of this study. We initially enrolled 104 patients but excluded five owing to a lack of study treatments, resulting in 99 patients randomized. Six did not provide self recalls, so the number of participants in the HFNC, LTOT, and LTOT groups was 47 and 46, respectively. This slide shows the baseline characteristics of the participants. Overall, the majority of the patients were male, elderly, severe stage of COPD, with mild hypercapnia with PSCO2 over 50 millimeters of mercury, and with severe airway of obstruction. There are no differences between the two groups. The primary endpoint counts for 52 weeks of moderate severe COPD observations were significantly lower in the HFNC L dot group than the L dot group 1.0 versus 2.5 per year. The time to first moderate severe COPD exacerbation was also significantly longer in the HFNC L dot group. The histograms of COPD exacerbation in each group on the right of this slide shows a lower frequency of COPD exacerbations in the HFNC L dot group. The counts per 52 weeks of COPD exacerbations with all severities were not different significantly. The counts per of severe COPD ex exacerbations were not different significantly as well. There was no significant group difference in time to death by all causes. Two patients in each treatment group died during this study. We assess health-related quality of life by SGLQC. Although HFMC-treated patients had improved HCLQC total score at week 24 and impact score at week 12 significantly, there are no significant improvements at any other observation points despite favoring trends for HFMC. Health-rated quality of life assessed with SRI was not different significantly between the two groups, although there was a favoring trend for HFMC. In terms of PSCO2, although there was a favoring trend for HFMC, 
there was no significant improvement between the two groups. HFAC treated patients had improved SpO2 only at week 52. In terms of pulmonary function tests, also HFNC treated patients had improved FVC at week 24 and FEV1 at week 12. There were no significant improvement at any other observation points. This slide shows the usage time and the flow rates of HFNC. The main usage time of HFNC was over seven hours per day. A total flow rates were 28.5 liters per minute and oxygen flow rates were around 1.5 liters per minute. Now you can see the adverse events. Most AEs of at least a moderate degree appeared in several patients in both treatment groups. Infection presented more than a 5% frequency in the HFNC out and out group as did respiratory thoracic and mediastinal disorders. In summary, HFNC l dot could reduce the COPD situation frequency and prolong the duration between moderate or severe COPD exacerbations. There are several variables with statistically significant differences between the treatment groups. AEs were infrequent in both groups, suggesting that HFNC is a safe treatment. Thank you. Hello, and thank you for the opportunity to present the feasibility of using daily home high flow nasal therapy in COPD patients following recent COPD hospitalization. My name is Gerard Kreiner. I'm a professor and founding chair of the Department of Thoracic Medicine and Surgery at the Lewis Katz School of Medicine at Temple University in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, USA. These are my disclosures. You can see that I've received grant funding from Fisher Paykel. So let me give you some short background. We know that high flow nasal therapy or HFNT has beneficial effects in patients hospitalized with acute hypoxemic respiratory failure. Some small and predominantly single center studies have shown short-term benefit in hospitalized and stable COPD patients. High flow nasal therapy, however, has not been extensively studied immediately following hospitalization for acute exacerbation of COPD. And it's currently not available for home use for patients recently hospitalized for COPD in the United States. Hence, we had the objective of this study to assess the feasibility of using daily home high flow nasal therapy during sleep and or daytime in COPD patients following a recent, less than 12 weeks, hospitalization for an acute exacerbation over a period of 90 days. <clears throat> and we powered this study to be used as preliminary data to look at safety and practicality to develop a prospective controlled multi-center trial to determine the effectiveness of high flow nasal therapy to decrease future moderate and or severe exacerbations or even death. This is our overall study design. The patients, as you can see, were hospitalized for an acute exacerbation. They met our entry criteria, which I'll describe to you subsequently. They had some baseline data, which I'll also describe to you. And over a period of 90 days, they received high flow nasal therapy with frequent contact over uh, 10 times over this period of 90 days. So about every 10 days, either at a phone call or a clinic visit to maximize adherence and understanding of the use of high flow nasal therapy. Then we repeated this baseline data to look at whether any outcome would change and whether there was any untoward complications with the use of the therapy. These were our entry criteria. Patients were over 80, uh, 40 years of age, hospitalized for an acute exacerbation within the prior 12 weeks. Patients had a diagnosis of COPD, physician diagnosis or self-determined diagnosis as a primary diagnosis for admission to the hospital. They had smoked more than 10 pack years and they were willing to provide informed consent plus willing to participate in all study related activities over that period of three months. Otherwise, the criteria were fairly broad. 
We excluded people, uh, patients who had upper airway or nasal complications that prohibited the use of high flow nasal therapy and patients that were using any form of positive airway therapy, CPAP or non-invasive ventilation within four weeks of study entry. So patients for sleep apnea or patients that were being ventilated with high flow, uh, with um, non-invasive ventilation for hypercapnic respiratory failure were excluded. Or if they had high likelihood of sleep apnea based on questionnaire determination. Our, this is what our intervention was. All participants were asked to use the MyAirvo 2 device, Fisher Paykel Healthcare, for a minimum of four hours per night. The flow rate was initially set at 25 liters per minute, and the oxygen uh, supplemental oxygen was bled in and titrated, maintain a pulse oximetry greater than 92% or greater, with a temperature range from 34 to 37 degrees. And we tried to drive patients to 37 degrees centigrade. And airflow was measured uh, through the OptiFlow nasal cannula device, uh, and that was sized for patient comfort, uh, comfort from small to large. This was the data that we collected, demographic data. Dyspnea was measured either using a modified Borg score and a modified MRC score. Blood gases were obtained at baseline at the end of the study after five minutes of inspiring oxygen to keep the saturation greater than 92%. COPD assessment tests or CAT score, SGRQ for um, disease specific quality of life was measured, six minute walk distance at baseline in, in the study, gold grade severity of airflow obstruction, and BODE was calculated by these measured parameters. To assess the patient's comfort, we use a 100 millimeter visual analog score for no discomfort at zero or maximal discomfort at 100. Um, a five-point Likert scale was used to measure sensation of breathlessness, marked, uh, marked deterioration to marked improvement. And we had an electronic daily diary that we used to measure patients' daily symptoms of breathlessness, cough consistency, so thick or thin, uh, quantity of sputum production, um, a tablespoon or greater, uh, and also whether the sputum was purulent or not, or not and then wheezing, sore throat and nasal congestion. And at the end of the study, all patients were offered to continue the use of high flow nasal therapy at the end of the 90 days if they wanted to use that or return it if they um, didn't want to use it any longer. This is our flow diagram of patients enrolled in the study. So we approached 41 patients that were recently hospitalized. They were consented. Three were screen fails, mainly because of either questionnaire determination of suggestion of sleep apnea or one sleep study that showed they did have sleep apnea. So 38 patients were scheduled for high flow nasal titration as an outpatient. Eight of them did not attend that nasal um, high flow titration visit, so they screen failed. So 30 patients were enrolled um, after they had high flow nasal titration and 28 completed that 90 day visit. Two patients that dropped out over the study duration, one was a, underwent lung transplantation, so for obvious reasons, they were excluded. And then one patient withdrew consent because they um, favored to sleep on their abdomen nightly and they found it troublesome to use a device over their nose, a high flow, so that patient withdrew from the study. This is our uh, baseline data. So our patients were about 70 years of age. It was gender balanced, uh, pretty much equal females to males enrolled in the study. Half of the patients were Caucasian and half of them were minority, predominantly African-American or Hispanic, which mirrors our community population at Temple in Philadelphia. They had a high burden of smoking at average about 43 pack years and patients tended to be slightly overweight with a BMI approximately 26. The patients were severely obstructed. About 50, a little bit more than 50% of them were very severe uh, gold grade um, four, uh, and the rest of them were gold grade three. So severe or very severe airflow obstruction. In our spirometry, the mean FEV1 was 0.75 liters, or about 28% of predicted and patients were severely breathless. Our MMRC, 28% were stage four, 46% were stage three. So most of these patients had severe or very severe limitation because of dyspnea by MMRC. Six minute walk 
distance, patients were compromised, it averaged about 223 meters. And again, highly symptomatic. Their Borg was 2.4. Their Bode index was in a third or fourth quartile overall, so it puts them at a severe stage of that. Highly symptomatic by SGRQ with uh, uh, SGRQ in the high 50s and a CAT score above 20. The mean was 21.6. Patients tended to be mildly to moderately hypoxemic and hypercapnic on presentation into the study. And all patients were using triple inhaled therapy, combinations of long acting uh, dual bronchodilators or short acting uh, dual bronchodilators based on their insurance and whether the patients were approved for long acting therapy or not. And as you can see, close to 100% of these patients were placed on inhaled corticosteroids. So triple inhaled therapy uh, of some form in approximately all the patients. These were our results for parameters of use. High flow nasal therapy was delivered at a flow rate of 35 liters per minute in 24 patients and 30 liters per minute in four patients. About half the patients required bled in supplemental oxygen, which ranged from 26 to 32% to maintain pulse oximetry, which was our, bait, our goal at 92% or greater. The rest of these patients were maintained on room air oxygen. All patients received high flow uh, nasal therapy at 37 degrees centigrade. One subsequently had the temperature lowered to 34 degrees at a subsequent visit. This is the baseline titration, and it remained throughout that temperature grade at 27 out of 20, 28 patients, with one subsequently uh, revised downward. And then 28 of 20, 30 patients used a high flow nasal therapy throughout the 90 day follow up period for an average of 6.8 hours per day. And you can see the standard deviation of about two hours around that mean data use, daily use. These are our secondary outcomes. Spirometry and six minute walk distance in meters remain the same at baseline to the last clinic visit where these uh, parameters were me measured. But you can see the symptomatic parameters such as gold, SGRQ and CAT trended to numerically um, uh, improve over that period of time with a trend towards the CAT score almost being statistically significant. And remember, none of these parameters were used. This is a pilot study to look at tolerance and feasibility for hours and, and kind of like the intervention parameters. So none of these parameters were powered for patient population. And then you can see the blood gases were unchanged a slightly higher PaO2 at the end of the study, but none of these were clinically or statistically significant. When we looked at the sensation of shortness of breath over the period of time, patients tended to show an improvement of their shortness of breath with a slight improvement in the majority of patients, about 75%, and a marked improvement in about 30% of the patient population. So again, this wasn't controlled, but it showed that this patient population trended after the period of 30 day, uh, 90 days to show an improvement in shortness of breath. When we looked at our daily symptom reports, and this was the mean of the daily symptoms across the 28 patients, you can see the cough trended to decrease over that period of time. Sputum color tended to be less purulent. Sputum consistency tended to be more thin and less thick. And the sputum quantity, the majority of the patients tended to have a decrease in the sputum production to none. And a minority of the patients, about 25%, had sputum that was a tablespoon of less over that period of time. And the incidence of self-reported wheezing also trended to decrease over that period of observation of three months or 90 days. <clears throat> when one looked at peak flow, you can see again, the mean peak flow had a slight improvement. It's about a 10% improvement of the mean peak flow over that period of time. You can see the trajectory slightly trends upward. And if you look at the nasal discomfort, this score was 100 on this y-axis, so you can see it's cut off, so we could show you what they showed. And you can see over the visit three, which is about um, a month after the patient began the study, you can see that the patient uh, kind of complaints of the nasal cannula, either causing runny nose or some um, kind of like just discomfort with the how the position in the nares 
tended to be trivial and decrease over time and was stable over the period of time of follow-up at three, four, and five months. So 45 days, 90, and then 90 days in follow-up. <clears throat> so what's our summary or conclusion from the study? Well, this single center study demonstrated the feasibility of using daily high-flow nasal therapy for at least three months in patients recently discharged from the hospital for a COPD exacerbation. This therapy was well tolerated, was patients could use it. They used it about 6.8 hours a day for mean data. And no patient needed to be removed from the study because they couldn't tolerate the intervention or had discomfort with either the high flow, the temperature, or the nasal prong. There were trends for improvement in quality of life, the CAT score, six minute walk, and daily respiratory symptoms that to us suggested that high flow um, therapy may have benefit in patients following a recent COPD hospitalization. But again, these findings are really preliminary and all they suggest to us that they require validation by a well-powered, prospective, multi-centered um, uh, controlled clinical trial. So thank you very much for allowing me to present at this time. I'd be happy to answer any questions in the question and answer period later on. Again, thank you very much. Dear colleagues, today I'm going to talk to you about the feasibility, the effectivity, and the cost effectiveness of domiciliary uh, high flow oxygen treatment in patients with COPD and chronic hypoxic failure. These are my disclosures. Now, uh, some of you may know that uh, a couple of years ago uh, we um, published this study on the long term effects of. Uh, oxygen-enriched high-flow treatment in COPD patients with uh, chronic hypoxic failure. It was a 12-month study. And by doing that, um, just to be uh, smart and fast, I dare say that we thereby also prove that treatment at home with high-flow is feasible. In that study, we show that the treatment reduced the number of exacerbations and the number of hospitalizations in these patients. We also saw that uh, patients had a relief of dyspnea uh, measured by the MMRC score and ameliorated their walking distance. We used, we used the six-minute walk test to evaluate that. We found an amelioration in health-related quality of life. And in a concomitant uh, qualitative study, we also found that the perceived quality of sleep was improved. Afterwards, we have done a couple of post hoc analysis, and we found that in the frequent exacerbators with uh, uh, ex more, more than two exacerbations per year, uh, the uh, high flow treatment was the most effective on both reduction in uh, exacerbations and hospitalizations. We also did analysis on uh, the patients who concomitantly had uh, persistent hypercapnic failure and found that over the 12 month treatment period, Patients reduced their CO2 levels, and we also saw an effect on the exacerbations in this group. So thereby, we can say that this treatment is actually effective. The question is now, is it cost effective? Recently, we published uh, this study uh, on the cost effectiveness of domiciliary high flow treatment in COPD patients with chronic respiratory failure. Uh, I did it in collaboration with my usually partner, usual partner in uh, science, uh, Lina Hustorgo. And uh, in this study, we collaborated with um, Sabrina Hustorgo Sarsen, who is a health economist. In the study, we included the uh, entire stu uh, study population from the original study, the 200 patients. We had 33% that did not complete the study, including those who died. And the missing data were handled by using multiple imputation. We included uh, cost of days in hospital, on outpatient visits, on emergency room visits, on both schedules and unscheduled GP visits, on medication and equipment for HFNC uh, in this uh, analysis. We also, we were so lucky because it was not planned uh, ahead to do a cost effective analysis on this study, but half of our population uh, lived in the municipality of Aalborg and uh, even more lucky, 
these uh, uh, 100 patients divided equally into um, HFNT treated and controls. And on this, uh, in this group, uh, uh, the municipality of Aalborg provided us data on cost of uh, home nurse care and nursing homes, in-home assistance, household cleaning and rehabilitation. And uh, I should add that also costs on telehealth care were included in this. The prices used in this study were for uh, MyO2 and consumables a mean a European price, and the cost for setup and service were based on Danish prices. The uh, costs that I presented to you in the last slides were um, <clears throat> the cost of uh, uh, the service that the year that the data were gathered. Now, how did we go about the conversion of these data? Because as I said to you previously, it was not planned ahead that uh, a cost-effectiveness uh, analysis should be made. So we used the SDRQ scores to uh, convert to uh, the health state utility values, the EQ5D5L utility values. And based on those, the quality adjusted life year quality was calculated using linear interpolation. And then the incremental cost effectiveness ratio, the ISA was calculated, and that is the mean difference in cost uh, divided by the, means different, the mean difference in quality between the HFNC group and the control group. Now here you have our baseline values. You, uh, those of you who have uh, read our uh, primary publication will see that a number of these values are familiar to you, but we have included in this, um, in this uh, 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 table one uh, data on uh, costs as well, both the um, municipality costs and the uh, hospital care costs and med medication costs, and there was no baseline differences in the two groups. And uh, in this slide, you can see the, the mean uh, unadjusted uh, resource utilization and cost per patient in the HFNC treated group and the control group uh, presented into uh, the cost categories. And here you can also see that we have uh, no uh, differences uh, at baseline. In this slide, we have the mean unadjusted cost per person uh, in each group for all cost categories within the 12 months of follow-up. And you can see that compared to the control group, the HFNC group is ending with a somewhat higher mean cost for um, hospital admissions, but at the same time, they had a lower uh, municipality cost. But again, there are no difference in P values. Now, for the complicated part, here we have the final analysis. We've done five scenarios. For one, the complete case-based analysis in which we can show that there is a probability of uh, high flow treatment being cost effective of uh, 83 to 92%. Then we did uh, four supplementary scenarios. For one, we had an analysis without adjustment for treatment days. And you can see that that reduces the probability of uh, the treatment being cost effective a bit to 75 to, 30, uh, to 83%. And that also shows us that that the treatment, it is the treatment that drives this, um, this uh, effectiveness as we had patients who gave up using um, high flow just after four days of treatment was the lower, lower range here. Um, and, and, uh, and that shows that it, it does influence these data. The next two scenarios uh, were done uh, to um, uh, let our colleagues around the world be able to relate to this study. We tried to vary the uh, cost for the H7C and consumables uh, to a plus minus of, minus of 30% of what was uh, used in the case uh, base analysis uh, to, for, for, patient, for, for, for treaters around the world to be able to relate to um, the prices they know for H7C, as we know the, uh, the, the costs vary around the world. And that shows us that if you, uh, if you reduce the price with 30%, you have a probability of the treatment being cost effective of 90 to 96%. If we increase with 30%, we have a probability of the treatment being effective of 72 to 85%. Lastly, 
we did a, a study, a, 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 um, an analysis on the group on which we had complete data. And in this group, we can see that the probability of the treatment being cost effective is 91 to 97%. So therefore, we dare to conclude that domiciliary high flow treatment is likely to be highly cost effective for this patient groups with, group with severe COPD and persistent respiratory failure compared to usual care. I would like to uh, thank my two collaborators and I would like to thank Fish and Peifel for inviting me to do this uh, little talk and to thank you uh, for listening in. Thank you. Many thanks. One more, once more. Uh, we know that the economic analysis, as I said, is complex. And uh, I really want to congratulate because these, are, these data are very difficult to collect. So you collect all the costs related mainly to uh, the medical side, like uh, GP's visit, emergency room visit, exacerbation, and so forth. I wonder if you also consider what some of the economists suggest us to do, like uh, if this uh, patient uh, need to use additional resources in terms of relatives or caregivers um, uh, that eventually uh, bring or brought them uh, to the hospital since maybe they were not able to go there and eventually if they need some, uh, I would say, additional uh, caregiver assistance uh, in the control group. Uh, I don't know if you, if you uh, assess these items, but I think it would be also interesting for us to know. Yeah, thank you for these questions, uh, Stefano. Um, to include the uh, cost uh, of uh, the relative's contribution, that is a really, really good point. Um, just to do a, a small promotion, last year I, did, I had an abstract in, in, at the ERS uh, just looking at uh, COPD patients' uh, use of uh, care from uh, other caregivers than the uh, formal caregivers. And, and we actually found that even patients with mild COPD had to have help from relatives every day on a daily basis. So therefore, it would have been very interesting to include this in this analysis. Uh, about half of our patients, and you should, uh, it was uh, equal, equally distributed into the two groups, were living alone. That tells us that this, uh, this type of treatment is actually feasible at home, even for severely ill patients who, um, who uh, have to uh, use and, uh, and uh, monitor the systems or keep the system, clean the system every day. It's feasible. Um, and uh, we had people uh, having their relatives uh, uh, transporting them into uh, the outpatient clinic, uh, some of them. Uh, so therefore, it would have been very interesting to include these data in the analysis. Unfortunately, we don't have them. Uh, but that will definitely be a point taken to uh, to the next study where we would like to look at uh, economy as well. So, um, brilliant. So, Dr. Nagata, thanks for your presentation and, and about high flow um, oxygen in patients with uh, stable COPD. I suppose my real questions are, and, and this is always focused on the patients and the patient center is at the center of the treatments on offer. Um, and my first question is, um, you know, what's the impact on the patient's symptoms? Um, and, and slightly going beyond just quality of life, but actually what the symptom burden is and whether symptom burden changes um, with this treatment. Thank you for your question. Uh, in uh, my uh, study, uh, the primary outcome was uh, the reduction of uh, the number of COPD exacerbation. Uh, Hyphrotherapy significantly uh, reduced the number of COPD exacerbation. Uh, as for the health-related 
quality of life assessed with the SGLQC uh, improved uh, significantly at several times, but not constantly significantly. So I think the impact for the health rate quality of life of uh, HFNC is uh, small, but uh, is uh, promising. So thank you once more. I have a further question about the setting of uh, nasal high flow therapy. Uh, you have uh, shown that you set the flow on, uh, the, on average of 28 liter uh, per minute, I guess. Well, uh, we know that it has been claimed, especially in the acute setting, that the higher is the flow, probably the better are the physiological effects. But this was in acute setting and mainly in a hypoxic patient. So I wonder how did you choose uh, this level of, uh, of flow? And if you think that uh, increasing even more the flow, I don't know, up to 35, 40 liter per minute, may further uh, improve the outcome of your patients. So the, uh, in this trial, the initial flow rate was set at uh, between 30 to 40 liter per minute, and we could down titer it to uh, it a minimum of 20 liter per minute, and the median flow rate was 28.5 liter per minute. In our experiences, uh, the patient at home cannot tolerate the over 40 liter per minute uh, uh, usually using in the uh, acute care setting. Uh, at home, patients uh, use the HFNC uh, every night for longer period. So I, uh, the appropriate flow rate is uh, sort of be lower than acute care setting. So, so in other clinical trials, uh, uh, the flow rate was set at uh, around 20 liter per minute as in the DMAX study. Thank you, Jerry. I think it was a very, very interesting presentation. Um, I have a couple of questions for you. The first one is about, maybe I missed in the presentation, how many of the patients at the end of a trial need and eventually they wanted to continue uh, nasal high flow therapy at home because one of your outcome was also how many of these patients wish to continue the therapy. I think it's going to be an interesting issue this one. My second question is about the enrollment criteria. Uh, I found quite interesting that contrary wise to all the other studies uh, on home non-invasive ventilation, you did not use as an entry criteria the persistent of hypercapnia. In other words, so you will enroll patient uh, with uh, a mean PACO2 of 41 plus minus six millimeter of mercury. So I wonder why did you make uh, this interesting selection of pressure. Because as I told you, all the other studies, uh, including those with NIV, enroll for protocol, patients still hypercapnic. So Stefano, thanks for those questions. In terms of patient of eligibility and uh, presence of baseline hypercapnia, our, our mean PCO2 is about 42 millimeters of mercury with a, a range of about five to six millimeters of mercury. So the, most of the patients were hypercapnic on presentation to the hospital, but the time of entry in the study, um, it was about a mixture, about 50-50. Our, our primary aim wasn't to look at seeing if we could um, just select patients with hypercapnic respiratory failure. It was to look at patients who had recently been hospitalized with severe COPD who suffer from hyperinflation and whether high flow to a generalized population being emitted would decrease the degree of hyperinflation by improving airway function as well as decreasing respiratory rate. So hypercapnia wasn't a key uh, inclusion criteria for us. In um, terms of follow-up, out of the 30 patients that we treated, we offered all patients to continue the, th the therapy. 
all of them did except for two, one underwent lung transplant and one was predominantly a uh, slept prone each night. So she found it difficult to use at night, but she continued to use it during the daytime. So except for that one individual, patients continued to use high flow for a substantially long period of time till either their demise or several of them also underwent transplant. Thank you to all the three speakers. I think this was an excellent uh, symposium. And uh, I think I learned a lot, uh, especially because uh, uh, the large majorities of studies so far about the use of uh, nasal high flow therapy was dedicated to the acute setting and mainly in the hypoxic patient. Here uh, is about time also to consider the potential benefits on the home care uh, scenario that, as you know, is totally different from the uh, hospital scenario. So once more, uh, I thank you, not only uh, the speaker, but also Fisher and Paykel for support uh, this uh, uh, very interesting initiative. And I thank also all the attendees and I wish you a nice day. Thank you.